Now we uh, like to welcome Chris Bubser. Uh, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So, um, so people know you. I'm gonna let you tell you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Then we'll start talking about cannabis. But you're running for Congress in the eighth congressional district. Uh, why don't you tell us where that is and uh, and how the race is going? Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. So California's 8th Congressional District is 33,000 square miles, a lot of wilderness and federal lands in Eastern California. So it starts down at Joshua Tree. It includes the communities of Needles, the high desert around Victorville, where I am right now, Hesperia, Atalanto, which we'll talk about a lot later, Apple Valley, and goes all the way through Inyo and Mono counties, all the way up to the Nevada border. So it's an enormous district. And ha the race is going very well, thank you. How this all happened was, you know, I spent several decades working in biotechnology for, the, for most of my career. And I worked on therapies for things like cancer and HIV back at the time where people had to use a lot of cannabis for HIV because they had wasting syndrome and it was the only way for them to maintain their health. So I have a long history of understanding the benefits. So. During my career, my own daughter developed epilepsy at the age of five, and I had to fight the insurance companies tooth and nail to do the kinds of things that should have just been provided automatically for a child with epilepsy. And what I learned was that our healthcare system is broken. So I left my career in 2017 because I realized that if we didn't once and for all protect the Affordable Care Act and then strengthen it to make sure we had health care for everybody, we were really going to see our healthcare system collapse. And here in this pandemic, we are seeing a lot of that come to fruition tragically. And the thing that I really learned along the way of trying to, so I was in Washington with people from the disability community trying to help save the Affordable Care Act. I saw representatives and senators who wouldn't even take meetings with their constituents. And one of them was Paul Cook, the representative for California 8. So I challenged him last year and he retired from Congress and now I'm running against Jay Obernolte, who votes um, against many measures that would benefit the people in our communities repeatedly. And now we have polling that shows that on the informed ballot, when we put our profiles next to each other, I'm up by a point. So we know that if I can get my message out, that it will benefit our communities. And so the other, so I started my campaign because of healthcare, but the more and more time I spend with people in all the areas of our district, the more that I see that we need economic opportunities. And one of the communities that needs it most of all is Atalanto. Even prior to this economic downturn, Atalanto stubbornly had double the national unemployment rate. So uh, in 2016, Atalanto um, allowed seed to sale cannabis businesses and that's creating economic opportunity and we need to make sure and that's also been true in needles and these are communities that i mentioned really need economic opportunity and this is a perfect opportunity for us to provide it so i intend to work as hard as i can for the next two months and make sure that we win this congressional seat so that we can continue the good work that's begun in our district with regard to cannabis. And, you know, I'll talk a little bit more later about also the medical uses and companies that are doing research in our district that will really help people as well. Terrific, Chris. And, and what are the kinds of things you think you can do uh, in Washington to help? Because, you know, and to some extent, this is a local problem, right? We, as we talked about with Steve a few minutes ago, we, we passed Prop 64, but many councils and board of supervisors are for one reason or another, either they don't have the three votes or they, or they really don't even have that are really been reluctant to do local stuff. What can you do and what can we do to support candidates like you um, to do at the federal level when you get there, hopefully in a, in a few months um, or in January, um, what can we do to, to help and support you? And, and what, what kind of things can the federal government do to, to help make this, the, this experiment work? Well, one of the things uh, that I really like to focus on is how do we make sure that we are providing the funding and the support for all kinds of uses, but particularly for medical uses, because that's what's nearest and dearest to my heart. So one of the things that's been really interesting is in Atalanto, the, one of the largest cannabis companies in the world, Takuno Lam, which is an Israeli company, has put its American headquarters here in Atalanto. They are studying multiple, 
inflammatory conditions, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because the CBD component of cannabis is very helpful with inflammation. So they're looking at multiple sclerosis, they're looking at inflammation, they're looking at Crohn's and colitis. But also there's studies in neurological disorders like epilepsy and autism. And I wanna make sure that we are cooperating and finding ways to advance this research because that will benefit communities like ours. You will need to have the seed to sell cities to be able to grow it, to be able to, I mean, then we have, you know, manufacturing facilities that we'll need to take the cannabis, you know, the THC, the CBD and purify it and turn it into medical products. That is an untapped business in this country that could create thousands of jobs, help people, help with our opioid problem because there are studies into pain. And so the possibilities are endless. So where you can help as the federal government is to make sure the funding is available, that we make it possible for companies to be able to provide this kind of research. You know, you have to really work on some of the patent issues because no one's gonna do research if they then can't protect their intellectual property. But we also wanna make sure that then it's still affordable and accessible for people. So there's so much that needs to be done. And this is what I did for my entire career. Right. So not with cannabis, but with other therapies. So it translates very easily. Right. No, that, that's beautiful. I have, a, I have a niece who's severely disabled and Epidiolex has been a lifesaver for her. She was having, you know, 70, 80 uh, little, little seizures a day and, and it's been reduced to a couple and it's, it's the quality of life for her is not, not good in general, but it, this has improved it. Um, so yeah, it, yeah, I really appreciate and applaud your, your passion and effort on the medical front. It's, it's so important. Um, you know, uh, and what about the recreational front? How do we, uh, how do we pair the two? It, it, do you lead with the medical, uh, you think at the federal level, and then that will, the, the recreational will follow, or do you think there's some things that can be done in recreational in the coming year? Let's assume we have a, you know, a, a change of, of at least the, the Senate probably is the most important change that we need um, because that's where things have been held up. Um, but, you know, what can we do on recreational? And one particular one question, which a lot of producers in California care about, because California produces so much for the rest of the country and the world, where the, where we are the, you know, like they call the Midwest the breadbasket. We're really the food basket for the world. And then on tech, the same way, um, we want to be able to ship our product to other states that have legalized it. Is, is there an opening there as well? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, it, it gets obviously very complicated very quickly, particularly with the banking uh, situation. But I do think that that's an opportunity and something we should explore because if it's legal in that state, then you know people want the best possible product. And I think that we all proudly believe that in California, you know, we have um, some of the best growers and the best technology. And so we should be able to capitalize on that and help our businesses, you know, when it's legal. Terrific. And, uh, and, you know, what do you see the federal prospects? Do you, do you, I mean, I, you know, I mentioned that, you know, the Senate's been the obstacle, you know, is that, is that your take too? Where do you see things going in the next year or two at the federal level? You know, truthfully, I think that it's really not um, going to be decided in the House. It's obviously going to be decided in the Senate. And I do think that, you know, if uh, the Senate majority goes Democratic, then, then that's possible. And I think that having this patchwork of state laws is, creates more problems than, than solutions. And so I really hope that, you know, we prevail in the Senate. Terrific. And, you know, uh, let's look forward a little bit. What do you, what do you think this, you know, that the time frame and, and the prospects look for cannabis on, on a legislative basis? Obviously, we, we, you know, we talked about how the, the Senate, cha Senate change in November would make a big difference, but are we talking, you know, one year, two year, five year, 10 years till we see federal improvement? Well, I do think that we've seen, you know, it was a little bit, um, it started very slowly with a couple of states and it seems to be moving much more quickly now. So just like many other things that took a long time at, you know, to get rolling at the state level, but then ultimately fundamentally shifted at the federal level, it's the same thing. I think that people are starting to realize that there are many, many benefits to cannabis and you know, that the states that have allowed it to be recreational, if you will, have allowed access to people like the elderly, like many others who just um, weren't going to be able to go through the process of getting the card and all of the different steps that it took and are benefiting. You know, everybody has stories of, you know, getting CBD heavy products for their older 
parent who is having sleeping problems or whatever that may be, um, helping with pain, the creams and things that we've had available. And that is the kind of situation that can benefit many people as long as, you know, and the truth of the matter is that it also needs to be regulated so that, you know, young people aren't getting access, um, that when it's done properly, it can actually, you know, benefit the people who need it and, and desire it the most without, you know, creating unintended consequences for, for our youth. Perfect. So, you know, the two, two things you've emphasized, uh, Chris, are that, you know, leading with a real emphasis on, on the medical benefits and why it can really make a difference. And then also for local communities on why this is economically really helpful to communities, particularly ones that are smaller towns and in, in, in more the remote parts of California that are struggling. What are some of the other arguments we as an industry and we as individual companies can make that, that will support your efforts and that will, 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 will start to promote some more change and some more progress on these issues? Well, I think um, those are two of the main ones. But the other thing is, you know, decriminalizing it is really important because the criminalization of marijuana has created terrible unintended consequences for many people and many lives. And the truth of the matter is that the more study there is, the more you realize that, you know, um, cannabis when used by consenting adults um, appropriately is really something that should be their business and their business alone. Right. So you, you think that, that bo both sides of the political spectrum would agree on that um, as leaders, because, because, you know, the, on the right, it's about being libertarian. On the left, it's about, you know, freedom of choice as well. Um, it is interesting that uh, the population in general, I think, feels that way. When we see the polls, you know, Prop 64 passed, I think, with 54%. Uh, uh, you know, in, in some communities, it was much more. We now look at the polling, and it's even higher. It, it's in the 61, 62. And one really important number is that um, I think it was Gallup who last fall, for the first time in polling this for 20 or 30 years, found that the majority of Republican voters support legalization. It seems to me that the, 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 the public is there and, and our leaders need to follow the public um, because, the, because you know, that, it's really clear where, where, where the population of the U.S. is pretty much everywhere. It's, it, you see places like Montana and Utah uh, passing recreational laws. You know, our, uh, Montana passed medical a long time ago and is now very likely to pack, pass recreational this year. Um, so let, let's add real quickly, like I did with Steve, talk about your race. Um, in your race, you probably do have some polling um, as a congressional candidate. And uh, A and, and B, are you getting good support from the, from the uh, National Party? Absolutely. You know, um, from the very beginning, you know, flipping a seat is always challenging. But certainly once, um, you know, the incumbent Paul Cook retired, then we knew that as an open seat, it gave us a better chance. And so, as I mentioned, our polling shows that I'm behind at the initial ballot because of name recognition. You know, my opponent has represents Assembly District 33, so that overlaps with much of our district and just naturally has more name recognition. The second that people see our two ballot statements side by side on the informed ballot, I'm ahead by a point. And then we, when we talk about the things that I've been discussing with you today about making sure we create opportunities for everyone in this right. district to have health care, um, once we really focus on economic opportunities that are on the ground in this community, then I pull ahead by quite a bit. So it's really just going to be a question of, you know, do we have the time to get our message out to all of the voters who might be, you know, willing to, uh, you know, come to the other right. side? We've certainly got strong, strong support among our base. Great, Chris. Great. Well, and, I, and I'm going to uh, say this, you know, it's, it's, it's not a typical thing for these type of things, but the reality is we have an interest as an industry in supporting candidates like Steve and Chris, and, and we'll, we'll talk with uh, Seppi and, and, uh, and David as well. We have, we, have, we have an obligation to support candidates who are supporting thoughtfully and, 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 and aggressively uh, our industry. And so, you know, go to these candidates' websites, uh, go to Chris Bubster's website, and, and we need to support them both, uh, you know, with our votes when we live in their districts, but also financially. So, Chris, really appreciate it. Good luck. I know you got a, a, a final sprint here to the, to the finish line November 3rd. Good luck. Thank you so much for your time. I'm really grateful to be here. Great, Chris. Thank you.